Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Today I have a very tough story for you and this is going to be a different episode from my usual Tuesday fair. This story comes right out of my hometown and you're going to go there with me today. This story is, sad isn't the word, it's heartbreaking. This story is also, in my opinion, even more terrifying than a lot of stories we talk about here. Why? Because this is a story about just how quickly two usual people can turn into monsters. This is a story about how little it takes to cause some people to lose all of their humanity. And this is a story about bigotry. It's a story about ego and it's a story about hate. Until recently, I could tell you with all confidence that you had never heard this story before. But just two years ago, some documentary filmmakers made a brilliant and heart-wrenching film about this story. And if you haven't seen it, you must. The film is called Dog Valley, and I'm really going to encourage you to see it. It's for free on Tubi right now, and it is very powerful. This is a story that needs to be remembered. This is the story of the murder of Gordon Church, a gay man living in small Mormon, Southern Utah in the 1980s. Let's get into it. Because this case involves a hate crime, I think it's important to talk about the culture that contributed to that crime. And because I'm so close to Cedar City, Utah, the site of the murder in my hometown, I decided to drive up there and give you a look around. I think seeing the town and knowing a little about it will give you some extra insight into this tragic story. And so we'll go there first and then we'll come back here and talk about the timeline of events. This is my hometown. I was born and raised here. This is Cedar City, Utah. It is world famous for two things, and one of those things is the reason our subject today, Gordon Church, was interested in attending school here. Gordon was very interested in drama, so he was excited to attend SUU, which was then called SUSC, Southern Utah State College. Cedar City is known for its annual summer Shakespearean festival. This little regional theater is so well respected that actors come from all over the world hoping for a part in one of Shakespeare's plays that is put on here. Does that surprise you? There are probably as many pigs and cows in this area as there are people, and yet this town has a fantastic Tony Award winning festival, all because of Fred Adams, the man who started it, who also lived just down the street from me. The Shakespearean Festival's home is here on Southern Utah University campus. SUU is an absolutely fantastic college, one of the best small colleges in the nation. It's a Division I school and offers students a really personal experience. A gal I went to high school with was just made its first female president. We are so proud of her. This college has one of the highest acceptance rates to medical and dental school in the country. The classes are small, the town is safe, and it is just simply an excellent school. Look at these beautiful grounds. Oh, the time I spent riding my best friend's moped on these trails and around this campus early in the mornings before anyone knew I was up. I felt so free back then. I have great memories of this campus even though I was never a student here. This stunning Shakespeare theater, patterned after the theaters of Shakespeare's day, is home to some of the best regional theater in the world. Jeremy Irons, Benjamin Bratt, Bradley Whitford, Matt Bomer, Harold Gould, and Ty Burrell have all stood on this stage. If you are a lover of theater, you should put little old Cedar City, Utah on your list of places to visit in the summertime. There are also contemporary plays held at the Randall Jones Memorial Theater. Gordon Church was thrilled to be going to school here and to be part of this very prestigious drama department during his time here at SUU. The second thing Cedar City is famous for is the Utah Summer Games. It's a little mini Olympics that's held each summer right here in Cedar. People come from all over the world to compete in the Summer Games and again its home is Southern Utah University. It's a great event with great tradition and offers people who would otherwise not have the option to compete a place to win those medals. So both of those things sound very cosmopolitan, very worldly, right? Well, they are. 
But the things that happen at the university are not really representative of the population of the town. Cedar City is populated by what I call good old boys, and I mean that about men and women. People here drive pickup trucks and horse trailers. It's a Mormon town, and it's a very Republican town, and it is very, very small town Americana. It is very much a town where most people talk the same, look the same, and have the same interests. It's a beautiful place with some very wonderful people who would give you the shirt off their back. It is not a place of diversity of any kind, and it is a place where if you do not fit into a couple of mainstream categories, you will stand out like a sore thumb. Now imagine how it was in the late 1980s. There are 30,000 people here now. There were only 10,000 back then. Most of these buildings you're seeing were not here then. The town was much, much smaller when I grew up here and when this murder took place in 1988. I didn't even know what a gay person was until I graduated from high school. I didn't even know gay existed. To say this is a sheltered place, a bubble? That's fair. This is the park I spent every single 4th of July at. The Lions Club sets up booths for food and games. This is Brad's Food Hut, the drive-in that serves as the turnaround spot when you're dragging Maine on Friday and Saturday night. Do people still do that? <laughs> this is the road to my childhood home. Man, I have not been on this road for a very long time and I was having all the feelings. I was definitely not prepared for what I saw when I arrived. This is the house I grew up in. It used to be dark brown with white brick. That room on the left was an open outside deck at the time. My parents remodeled it and added that room after I moved out. My folks sold this house about 12 years ago, but across the street, my father and several of the other neighbors had pooled their money and built a tennis court. And I'd heard my father mention they were tearing it out, but I wasn't prepared. I teared up. I don't even know how many tennis balls I've hit against that concrete wall. We had school dances on that tennis court. We roller skated with our friends on it. I had to mow both tiers of the lawn as part of my Saturday chores for years. And this really broke my heart. But things change, and even in a town of not much change, this has changed. I love this place. I always will. Some of my best memories were made here, and I will be forever grateful to the Cedar people who shaped my life. It's a great town. But I would be lying if I said that I would bring my gay friends here without a second thought. Now, of course there are gay people here. There are gay people everywhere. There always has been. If you think otherwise, my friends, you're wrong. Some of my gay friends are, well, one of them, for example, is 6'2", 6'10", in the heels that he wears. <laughs> there are people here who wouldn't take to him, even now in 2022, and they wouldn't hesitate to let him know he isn't welcome. I would be a little worried about him here. Now, of course, there are also people who wouldn't mind at all. Of course there are. But I guess what I'm saying is that I know these friends of mine can walk around in Las Vegas or Miami or Phoenix without much concern. They couldn't do that here. I regularly see things on Facebook from Cedar folks saying things like, why do gay people have to shove it in our faces? Honey, a gay man that's wearing something colorful or loud or wearing makeup or heels ain't thinking about you. You're just not that important. A woman who wants to hold hands with a woman ain't thinking about you. Not everything is about you. But as we know, there are people with that mindset everywhere, more so in small towns. That can be said for a lot of small towns, and Cedar is no different. Now times that culture and the mindset by a hundred, and you'll have the 1980s here. Gordon Church was a gay man in a small Mormon town that did not take kindly to gay men, and he paid with his life. November 22nd, 1988. Most of us know about the horrific murder of Matthew Shepard in 1998, the gay man who was brutally murdered in Wyoming in a hate crime. Well, 10 years before that happened, in a case most people have not heard of, Gordon Church met a similar fate. I will not be able to go into all of the details of what happened to this young man because this platform will not allow it. Even if I don't get graphic, the details are such that I will not be able to even insinuate some of what was done to him. This is the kind of murder that makes you lose faith in humanity. It's the kind of murder, it's the kind of murder that reminds you evil walks among us and it's the kind of murder that keeps me up at night. Gordon Church was a drama student at Southern Utah State College, SUSC for short, which is now again called Southern Utah University. I reached out to people who knew Gordon and they have very fond memories of him. 
one friend of his told me that Gordon was quiet and polite and that not everyone was kind to him. He loved theater and he was close with his family. A cousin of Gordon's told me that his murder devastated his parents and that they were never the same afterwards. Gordon was not really openly gay. The people closest to him knew of his orientation, but he hid it from his family. Obviously, being gay was not accepted in Mormon families, and there are still issues there. There was a very small, very tight-knit group of gay men in Cedar City at the time. I am friends with a couple of people that ran in that group, and one of them told me that even in their own group, Gordon was sometimes not treated well because he was so nice, and some of the others were not. Gordon was very sweet, and he made for an easy target for some of the more mean-spirited members of that group. He had some close girlfriends and he had his theater friends and he was well loved and respected in those circles. One friend said he was a beautiful person with a big heart and a great sense of humor. Gordon was born in 1960 to a devout Mormon family. He was born 10 years before I was, but he attended the same high school that I did, this high school here. This is Cedar High. The outside hasn't changed much from when I went there or from when Gordon went there. Gordon was accepted to Southern Utah State College and was majoring in drama. He had left school for a time and then had returned in his late 20s. He was 28 years old at the time of his death. It was the Thanksgiving holiday in 1988. There isn't much to do in Cedar City at night, nothing really. The town pretty much shuts down around 8.30 and all we had to do was drag Maine. For my foreign viewers or people that grew up in a big city, dragging Maine means you get in your car and you go down the main road in the town, you turn around at a designated location and then you go back up Main Street, you turn around and you do it all again. That's all there was to do. <laughs> there were often keg parties out in the woods as well, but I was way too scared to go to those. I just, that was too much for me. On this particular night, right before the Thanksgiving break, Gordon was supposed to meet his good friend, Kathy Long, to have a last minute dinner before everyone went home to see their families for Thanksgiving. They were supposed to meet at an apartment and then they were all going to go out to eat together. Gordon told Kathy that he had to stop at 7-Eleven and buy a pack of cigarettes and that after that he would be over to her house. The time came to meet at the apartment and Gordon didn't show up. With no cell phones, of course, there was no way to contact him. Kathy and a couple other friends waited an hour and then two hours. No Gordon. They finally went to dinner without him, but they were very concerned as to what was going on because it was out of character for Gordon not to show up when they had plans. Not in their worst nightmares could they imagine what was happening to their friend as they waited and then went to eat. This is Michael Anthony Archuleta and this is Lance Wood. Both men had done time in prison and had been recently released. They were living with their girlfriends right here at this apartment building. When I first got married, I lived right up this street and my dad's old law firm is right behind me. Well, the back entrance is anyway. There had been some type of an argument between the young women and the men and the men left the apartment to drink and to blow off some steam. Lance Wood was 20 years old at the time and Michael Archuleta was 26. Lance Wood was blonde and tall. Some people have described him as handsome and charming. Michael Archuleta was short and stocky and he had prison tattoos. Lance, Michael, and Gordon were all right here at this convenience store. In 1988, this was a 7-Eleven. It is now a Maverick. I remember there being pay phones. For some reason, I remember them being right here on the left, but there are windows there, so they must have been over here on the right. This used to be very much a hangout. There were always people standing around smoking by the pay phones. And this was the place to go for beer and cigarettes. Even in this little Mormon town, there were people that smoked and drank. Lance Wood saw Gordon getting into his car after buying his cigarettes. The car was a white 1978 Ford Thunderbird. Lance walked up to Gordon and started chatting. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with gay culture, especially in decades past. <sighs> Straight men don't just usually walk up to someone sitting in their car and strike up a conversation. You know what I mean? And you might not also be aware that there are a lot of men who live their lives like they are straight, but they are not straight. And they know how to spot and pick up someone that they might be interested in having a tryst with. It feels to me like Lance Wood was one of those people. Lance and Michael Archuleta tell Gordon that they're going to run inside the store and they'll be right back. 
Apparently, when they got in the store, they kind of talked about what they were going to do with Gordon. But Lance and Michael's accounts vary on this conversation. Lance and Michael then left the store and they got into the car with Gordon. I'm sure Gordon was just kind of going with the flow. He's got these two young guys. One of them's kind of handsome. The other one's kind of rough around the edges. You know, maybe he was thinking they want to hook up. The three of them left and began dragging Maine. I don't think Lance or Michael had a car, so they were kind of using Gordon for a ride. The two of them were yelling out the window at girls walking by and even had Gordon stop the car a couple of times so they could talk to girls, even though both of them had girlfriends at home. Then Lance and Michael told Gordon that they wanted him to drive up the canyon. On the east side of town is the entrance to Cedar Canyon and it's a common place to go and drive around at night, even though the roads are pretty dangerous. There are a lot of accidents in the canyon. At some point during the car ride, Gordon confirmed to Lance and Michael that he was gay. I feel like Lance and Michael already knew this. Gordon asked Lance if he wanted to have sex with him and told him that he had a condom with him. The trio pulled off to the side of the road and went up on a dirt road to be out of view. The three men got out of the car and began to walk up a trail together. Lance and Michael would later say they were doing this to rob Gordon, but that's just their cover. Everyone involved knew what they were doing there. As they walked, Michael Anthony Archuleta suddenly attacked Gordon. He pulled a knife from a sheath on his belt and put it to Gordon's neck. He made a small surface cut and then Gordon broke free and began to run. Michael tackled him and when Gordon fell, his arm broke. Michael then sat on top of Gordon and made another surface cut in the form of an X on Gordon's neck. Michael Archuleta then dragged Gordon to the hood of the car and threw him over it. I cannot say the word here, but he assaulted Gordon. As Gordon lay injured and crying, Michael then went to the trunk of the car and found tire chains and battery cables. Both of those things were used against Gordon. The battery cables were attached to a very sensitive area and other things were done to this man. Oh God. The level of evil that it takes is just astonishing. You've got two against one, a helpless 150 pound young man against two larger men. It's just such a disgusting and cowardly act, all because they're angry at their own sexual urges towards that man. It's just unthinkable. Lance Wood then got behind Gordon and twisted his neck and Gordon fell to the ground. Lance and Michael then threw Gordon in the trunk of his own car after binding him with the tire chains and several bungee cords and they drove down the canyon. They would have driven on this road heading north. As you can see, Cedar City turns more industrial in this part of town. It was a lot more desolate back in the 1980s. A lot of these buildings weren't even here back then. This exit is newer, but the group would have then got onto I-15, headed north, and they began to drive. As I drove this same path, I thought about Gordon in the trunk of that car, laying there with a broken arm, having been assaulted, brutalized, and I thought about what must have been going through his mind. It's heartbreaking. He knew they were on the freeway. He knew he was being driven away from help, and it must have been absolutely terrifying. The pair traveled about 75 miles north of Cedar City into Millard County and pulled off on the Dog Valley exit. Michael Archuleta looked at Lance Wood and said, we're gonna have to kill him. They found a remote spot here in the tumbleweeds and the dirt and they pulled over. They dragged Gordon out of the trunk and I really cannot tell you all that was done. Whatever you're thinking, it's probably worse. A tire jack was used in several ways. Gordon's liver was punctured and the coroner would later say his skull looked as though he had been run over by a truck. When Gordon was dead, his killers dragged his body off the dirt road and covered it with a little bit of dirt and some tree limbs. They left him there, dead and alone, and they took his car and drove to Salt Lake City. The men abandoned Gordon's car in Salt Lake and, with their clothing covered in blood, walked into a nearby thrift store. They bought pants and shirts and told the clerk that they had been rabbit hunting. They then threw their blood-stained clothing in a drainage ditch in Salt Lake County. They walked to a nearby on-ramp and held out their thumbs and soon someone pulled over and drove them back to Cedar City. Now, if this is not a lesson on not picking up hitchhikers, I don't know what is. Can you imagine what the person who picked them up thought later on when they heard who they were and who they had had in their car? I mean, hitchhiking is just a bad idea all the way around. It seemed like Michael Archuleta and Lance Wood were going to get away with murder, but then Lance Wood got nervous. 
He started to think about the fact that someone was going to find Gordon's body, that someone might have seen them get into his car, and he decided he was going to come forward and lay all the blame at Michael Archuleta's feet before someone could blame him. Lance went to his parole officer and told that officer that he watched as Michael Archuleta killed a man in Dog Valley. The parole officer called the Iron County Sheriff and the Iron County Attorney. They put Lance in a car and they drove to Dog Valley. There, they found the body of Gordon Church. They then contacted the Millard County Sheriff's Office after realizing the murder had actually taken place in that jurisdiction. Lance Wood sat calmly and ate breakfast as he retold this horrific story to those officials. It didn't take any of the cops long to realize that Lance Wood had done much more than watch. At the crime scene, the blood spatter alone indicated that two people were involved. The footprints, the brutality of the beating, it all pointed towards two attackers. Lance Wood told this story without any remorse, smiling and joking as if he was talking about something that happened at work or at home. You see him here at the crime scene with the officers and it is chilling footage. He's speaking about these horrifying events as if they're nothing to him. He is truly an evil and terrible human being. Once the cops found the body, the Iron County cops went racing back to Cedar City for Michael Archuleta. Quickly, a team of officers was assembled and they surrounded this apartment building where their girlfriends lived to arrest Michael Archuleta. I have a friend, a classmate of mine, who watched this entire thing. Archuleta was found in bed with his girlfriend and was dragged out of this building in handcuffs. When in custody, Michael Archuleta had a very different story to tell from Lance Woods, because of course he did. Soon, both men were pointing the finger at each other, but authorities knew they were both going to go down for this vicious murder. A change of venue was granted because Millard County is so small that there wasn't anyone who hadn't heard about the murder to sit on the jury. Michael Archuleta went to trial in December of 1989. The jury found him guilty and he was given the death penalty. Lance Wood went to trial in January of 1990. He too was found guilty, but he was given a life sentence. If you watch the documentary Dog Valley, you will see these very small town sheriffs say they think a lot of that had to do with the fact that Michael Archuleta was Hispanic and Lance Wood was white. Those things happen, you guys. It's not just about people on one end of the spectrum of politics crying about it. That's our reality. The Millard Sheriff said in an interview years later that because there were no hate crime laws on the books back then, life in prison was the best they could hope for. Now, both men would most likely get the death penalty because of newer hate crime legislation, but that simply wasn't an option back then. The sheriff also said that Lance Wood was seen as a good Mormon boy. He had his bishop and his scoutmaster come in and testify for him. And that actually makes me furious. Not for nothing, people can do what they want, but don't be calling me to testify on behalf of your evil ass. I don't care what good friends we are. I don't care how we know each other. I am not saying anything nice about you. It frustrates me that his church leaders were willing to sit on the stand and talk about what a great kid he was. That just, it makes me mad. So these two monsters are sent off to prison. Lance Wood proceeds to get violation after violation for having sex with prison employees. And then a woman named Renee McKenzie, the wife of an Idaho senator who is helping Lance with his legal case, falls in love with Lance. I cannot, I cannot. This woman leaves her husband, the senator, and marries Lance in prison. She was actually facing some jail time because as a legal worker, she's not allowed to have romantic involvement with prisoners, but of course nothing was ever done to her. The prison moved Lance to Oregon and then he and this Renee woman filed a $50 million lawsuit against the Idaho Department of Corrections. Just why do these garbage people always find each other? I swear for every evil and heartless killer out there, there is a woman where the roof ain't nailed all the way down. You know what I'm saying? I read one article that said Lance Wood had been paroled a few years ago, but even the reporter in that article said he couldn't verify that. If he's paroled, I, I, I don't know, that I gotta find out now. I'm gonna find out. I didn't have time to call my connections in the Utah prison system before I had to film this, but I'm gonna find out. I did an inmate search of the Utah prison system, and the weird thing is, is it shows Lance as being housed, but it says his unit is not available, and it says date of parole not available. 
Now, when I've looked people up before that have been paroled, their name is just not in the system anymore. They're not an inmate. But his name was still listed as an inmate, even though N.A. was listed next to parole date and the housing unit he was in. So I don't know what's going on there, but I am going to find out. Michael Anthony Archuleta is still sitting on death row at the Utah State Prison. The last article I found was from 2021. Michael's attorney is asking that the DA recuse himself for one reason or another, but anyway, he's still alive. All of these years later, I think Michael Archuleta is a great example of why our death penalty system needs a total overhaul. There is no question he committed this murder, none. If you're going to give people the death penalty, then either carry it out or get rid of the system entirely. I know each case is different and we know that innocent people have been executed. So maybe change the appeals process. Create a new category for people with undeniable evidence against them. Something. Or just do away with the death penalty. I'm sure that Gordon's family would rather have this guy just locked away forever than having to be dragged back and forth to parole hearings forever. That's my issue with the death penalty. I feel like it punishes the families of the victims more than it punishes the killers. Lock them up and throw away the key and let them have their appeals until they can't appeal anymore. But that way the families know they're never getting out. This story, like I said in the beginning, is the kind of story that keeps me up at night. It's the kind of story that makes me lose faith in people. These two young men on a random night transformed from human beings into actual monsters all because someone was smaller and weaker and different from them. They did unspeakable things to a wonderful person who was doing nothing wrong, who was simply trying to make a human connection, and for that, he lost his whole life. I want to send my love to Gordon's family and to his friends and to anyone who knew him or was affected by this murder, including the police officers. Please watch the documentary called Dog Valley. Again, it's on Tubi for free, and it is a fantastic film. You will see the effect this murder had on even the tough old cops that worked the case. You will get a feel for why this is an important story. Watch it. And if you're so inclined, light a candle or say a prayer or do whatever it is you do for Gordon. Let's keep his name and his memory alive. Let's remember him not only as the good person that he was, but as a symbol for why it is important that we protect marginalized people in this world. It does not have anything to do with politics. It has to do with our humanity. We protect those who are in the minority because we are better than those of us who would do them harm. It's what separates us from the monsters who live among us. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Hit the like button if you liked the video and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more from me. You can also join my Patreon and there will be some bonus content coming there, I promise, soon. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.